The book is divided into two main parts. Part one focuses on understanding the self and covers topics like, like depression, anxiety, trauma, addiction, and self-criticism, introducing the ultimate voiceover tool for professionals and amateurs, a powerful and easy-to-use software that lets you easily create high-quality voiceovers. Part two focuses on understanding relationships and is divided into four sections. The first section covers being single, topics like solo living, fantasy relationships, and loneliness. The second section covers finding a relationship, with chapters on dating, sexual chemistry, and obsession. The third section looks at being in a relationship, with chapters on attachment styles, codependency, boundaries, fighting, and communication. The final section covers being out of a relationship, with chapters on cheating, breakups, and gr The preface notes that all patient stories will be fictionalized. It also explains the author's preference for using the term patient over client. The introduction provides background on the author's experience with therapy and overcoming binge eating. It sets up the overall theme that psychological problems are often coping mechanisms and the importance of getting to the root causes below the surface. Additional sections include acknowledgments, resources, and notes information about the author and copyright details. The book aims to help readers gain deeper self-awareness through answering questions about psychology and relationships. This will empower people in their healing journeys, whether through therapy or on their own. It encourages getting curious about the root causes of problems, not just the surface-level symptoms. We are asked to think like detectives and consider how early life experiences may have shaped current behaviors and patterns. A five-step process is outlined for gaining insight. Get curious, understand, feel, act, repeat. This involves exploring past experiences, emotions, making changes, and continual reflection as patterns emerge. Healing is not linear, but iterative. Readers are told to openly share any thoughts or feelings that arise, as these could provide unconscious clues. Playing detective by noticing bodily reactions and journaling is suggested. While insight is important, True understanding requires feeling deeper emotions rather than just intellectual awareness. Ongoing reflection is needed to challenge old patterns. The goal is empowerment through self-awareness, so readers can better understand themselves and their relationships instead of just trying to fix problems. The passage discusses why understanding one's childhood experiences is important for therapy and addressing mental health issues. Early childhood from birth to age five is a critical period for brain development and learning about relationships, emotions, and the world. Events during this time can have deep consequences on who we become. As children, we learn survival skills like maintaining connections to our parents, who we depend on completely. We become highly attuned to signals that strengthen or weaken these relationships. Experiences like lack of parental presence, shouting, or high stress send fear signals that something is wrong. As children, we try to fix this and keep our parents happy slash loving us through behaviors that we think will elicit their love and repress behaviors we think may lose their love. We also implicitly learn social and cultural norms from our environment regarding appropriate behaviors, emotions, thoughts based on gender, class, culture, etc. Understanding our childhood experiences and messages is important for therapy to address deeper mental health issues. Adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, like abuse, neglect, family dysfunction, can have long-lasting negative impacts on physical and mental health. The more ACEs someone experiences, the greater these even seemingly minor childhood hardships like parental separation, bullying, or family turmoil can be psychologically traumatic for a child by threatening their sense of stability and safety. We all have both have both positive experiences from our childhoods that shape who we become as adults, even if our upbringing seemed good overall. It's important to gain self-awareness about how our earliest relationships and life events still influence us. Recalling childhood memories and feelings without judgment can provide insight into repressed emotions and where learned patterns of relating to oneself and others originated. Therapy aims to make the unconscious conscious the therapist uses Alva's story of her father's angry outbursts in her youth as an example of how even small acts of disconnection from a caregiver at a vulnerable age can result in emotion repression and addiction to numbing behaviors as a coping mechanism as an adult. 
Gaining empathy for her experience allows therapeutic connection and healing to begin. The key ideas are that childhood experiences, even seemingly minor ones, can be psychologically traumatic for developing children. Repressed emotions from these events unconsciously influence adult thoughts and behaviors. And remembering and reflecting on early life in a non-judgmental way in therapy helps address underlying issues and develop self-understanding. The girl feels afraid and angry, but was not allowed to openly express or feel those emotions as a child. She likely learned from her parents' reactions that some emotions were more acceptable than others. Her parents may not have talked about feelings, always encouraged happiness, were too fragile to upset, or got upset when she expressed negative emotions. This caused her to repress her natural feelings like sadness, anger, and frustration in order to get love and attention from her parents. She came to believe that certain emotions were not safe to express. As an adult, this has led to limiting beliefs, self-sabotage, difficulties expressing vulnerability or having emotional conversations, and pushing away positive relationships or opportunities in favor of familiar negative patterns. She is unconsciously protecting herself from past experiences of shame, rejection, or threat when expressing certain emotions as a child, but this behavior now does more harm by causing suffering and holding her back in life. She feels afraid and angry deep down, but doesn't allow herself to consciously feel or acknowledge those emotions due to how she was conditioned as a child. Feelings and emotions are types of energetic sensations in the body. When we suppress feelings, we use up a lot of mental and physical energy to keep them buried down. This can lead to depression and ex to fully feel our feelings. We need to connect with what's going on in our bodies and pay attention to physical tension, pain, sensations, etc. Our bodies often hold feelings we're not consciously aware of. Free association and journaling allow unconscious thoughts and memories to surface without censoring. This can help us uncover early life experiences and traumas that may be underlying our current emotional struggles. Breathwork techniques like holotropic breathing increase oxygen in the body and facilitate emotional release through fast-paced breathing patterns. This can help move stuck emotions and reduce stress. It sometimes brings up powerful repressed feelings. Healing often means allowing oneself to fully experience painful emotions that were previously avoided. This can feel temporarily difficult, but is important for long-term resolution of emotional issues and lifting of depression. George is struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts after his wife's pregnancy triggers unconscious memories of when his sister was born. As a child, George felt neglected by his parents when they focused all their attention on his ill sister. He repressed these difficult feelings for years. Through therapy, George begins to explore and process these long-buried emotions. With his therapist's gentle guidance, he realizes how the upcoming birth revived feelings of anxiety that he would lose his wife's love too. Expressing these vulnerable emotions in a safe space helps relieve George's. When his daughter is born, George feels an intense love for her, but also worries about feelings of jealousy and fear. Continuing therapy allows George to acknowledge and work through these complicated reactions in a healthy way. Expressing his true emotions rather than repressing them improves George's mental well-being and relationships. Connecting past trauma to present feelings helps George better understand and cope with his depression. George has a low feeling when his wife becomes pregnant as it triggers memories from his past. On a good day, he is able to share how he is feeling with his wife without blame, and they work through it together. However, on a bad day when they are both tired, George reverts to old coping strategies like sulking. The low feeling returns. The key point is that George, like all humans, is a work in progress. He is trying to deal with his feelings in a constructive way, but he is not perfect and still struggles at times, especially when under stress. Being tired or stressed can cause even the best of us to temporarily resort to less effective coping strategies. The passage suggests we should have empathy for George and see him as human, rather than judging him for not always handling his feelings in the best way. He is doing his best to understand and manage how depression affects him. Anxiety is a normal human response to potential threats or dangers as a survival mechanism. 
However, many people experience chronic, excessive anxiety. Anxiety can manifest in rumination, worries about health, relationships, others' perceptions, obsessive thoughts and behaviors, and an overall sense of unease. The root causes of anxiety can be different for everyone. Common roots include past trauma, social anxieties stemming from feeling inferior to others, anxiety about relationships from fear of rejection, and anxiety from negative self-perception. Rather than trying to get rid of anxiety, it's important to understand what it's trying to communicate. Anxiety is often a sign that something in one's past or present is feeling unsafe or in Common roots of anxiety include past experiences of traumatic events, instability, feeling vulnerable without protection as a child, and lack of emotional security from parents who struggled with their own mental health issues. Anxiety can serve the purpose of feeling in control by worrying about potential threats and catastrophizing the future. Accepting lack of control can help lessen anxiety. At times, anxiety is used to avoid deeper, more difficult underlying feelings that may be blocked or unprocessed. Anxiety could also indicate a lack of learning how to self-soothe as a child if emotional needs were not properly met by parents. Developing strong boundaries is important for feeling safe and in control, which can help soothe anxiety. Lacking parental boundaries as a child can contribute to poor boundary development. Boundaries provide structure, consistency, and a sense of safety, security. They help people feel contained and held. People who struggle with anxiety often didn't have strong, clear boundaries modeled for them growing up. Kelly's mother had very poor boundaries. She viewed Kelly more as a friend peer than a daughter, sharing inappropriate levels of personal details. This blurred boundaries, having no sense of privacy, self, or separation from a parent can cause anxiety because it's a violation of normal child development. In therapy, Kelly struggled with boundaries at first, crossing them like she was used to at home. Setting boundaries was important for managing her anxiety. Understanding the source of one's anxiety helps change the relationship with it. Anxiety is trying to protect, so compassion is key rather than fighting it. For Kelly, setting boundaries with her mother, expressing her own needs, feelings, and gaining a stronger sense of identity and independence helped relieve her anxiety over time. Structure and boundaries provided safety. So in summary, a lack of clear boundaries as a child can contribute to anxiety by violating normal development and making one feel a lack of control, privacy, or self. Re-establishing boundaries as an adult through therapy helps manage anxiety by providing that lost sense of structure, safety, and autonomy. Stress and trauma can have long-term physical health impacts if the stress response is not fully resolved. The body stores memories of stressful events, even if the mind forgets. Constant stress leads to increased risk of chronic conditions like autoimmune disorders, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. Traumatic events trigger the body's fear response, fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. Stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline are released. If the event is not fully processed emotionally, the stress response remains activated. The nervous system gets stuck in a heightened state of fear and alertness. This causes hypersensitivity and overreaction to perceived threats. People may feel constantly on edge and unable to relax. Wild animals can fully discharge stress hormones through shaking after an event. But humans often don't complete the stress response cycle, so the body remains in a heightened stress state. Therapy aims to help process traumatic memories and emotions so the nervous system can return to homeostasis rather than remaining chronically stressed and stuck in a fear response. This helps resolve physical health issues stemming from long-term stress. The passage discusses how trauma and stress can dysregulate the nervous system, especially if experienced during childhood when the nervous system is still developing. This can lead to long-term issues like anxiety, panic attacks, difficulty sleeping, chronic pain, etc. It provides examples of big traumatic events like abuse, but also little T traumas that on their own may not seem significant, but can dysregulate the nervous system over time. It describes a client, Arlon, who seems to have a dysregulated nervous system from childhood traumas of living with an abusive stepfather. He has many stress symptoms like difficulty sleeping, migraines, etc. The treatment focuses on helping Arlon connect to his body's stress responses, process the traumatic memories, and learn self-soothing techniques to feel safer. Practices like mindfulness, breathwork, 
and checking in with his body are helping him sleep better and manage stress level. The goal is to help Arlon's nervous system relearn that he is no longer in danger, which is addressing the root cause of his long-term stress symptoms from childhood trauma. The passage describes a woman named Lana, who is seeking therapy because her partner, Antony, feels she neglects their family due to overworking. Lana is constantly checking her phone, wants shorter therapy sessions, and insists she does not have a problem. The therapist senses Lana is testing boundaries to feel safe. While accommodating shorter sessions, the therapist maintains the normal 50-minute time limit. Lana is frequently late to sessions, which the therapist sees as an unconscious pattern representing something bigger. Though Lana appears successful, the constant overwork is negatively impacting her marriage and family life. Her lateness to therapy also shows a lack of respect and priority for the treatment. The therapist is left trying to understand Lana's issue and help her address the root causes behind her addiction to overworking. Lana is addicted to work and pouring all her energy into it, often coming late to therapy sessions. When confronted about being late again, she says work takes priority. The therapist questions if work takes priority over herself, telling her therapy is for her own time. Lana rolls her eyes and says, the therapist sounds like her husband. While Lana's addictive behavior with work is not typical, the therapist says addiction is any compulsive behavior used to manage psychological pain. He suspects Lana can't stop working because if she did, she'd have to face inner. Nathan struggles with more conventional addictions to drugs and alcohol since age 14. It started as fitting in, but now at 35, it's impacting his work and relationships as friends are settling down. Nathan first drank alcohol in school after being bullied for being effeminate. Drinking allowed him to gain acceptance from the popular crowd. Drinking became how he earned respect and fitted in, but is now how he loses it as an adult who can't stop. The therapist says addiction is an inability to stop a behavior or use a substance, despite negative consequences. It serves to manage inner pain or trauma from early life experiences like neglect or abuse that wasn't properly soothed. Addictive coping develops to fill an emotional void. Lana tells the therapist about a dream where she was trying to patch up a hole as water flooded in, but a man named Jack kept taking her materials out. She gets upset as the water rises. When asked, Lana admits she has an uncle Jack but doesn't want to talk about him. She stares blankly, seeming disconnected from reality. Lana confirms Uncle Jack abused her as a child when her parents left her in his care. She blocked out many memories but knows he touched her inappropriately. Lana avoided going home by staying late at school and joining extracurriculars, as working was soothing and safe for her. As an adult, she works excessively though has lost purpose. Through therapy, Lana expresses her emotions about the abuse and lessens her shame. Speaking about her trauma is important for making sense of her experiences and retelling the story locked inside her. Lana realizes work helps her avoid her current relationship due to fears of getting close after her past trauma. She and her partner work on building trust and intimacy through open communication. Here are a few key points summarized from the passage. The individual was able to express her confusion, disgust, grief, and horror through her work as a coping mechanism. Nathan also used work to cope with the bullying he experienced as a child, which led him to drink. Nathan described the bullying he faced in detail, being isolated, partners not wanting to work with him, silence when he spoke. He recounted the feelings of shame, confusion, and feeling repulsive. However, he recounted the story with a sunny demeanor, not connecting to the emotional act. People can split off from painful memories and emotions as a way to cope and avoid feeling the hurt. This leads to addiction as a way to manage those unwanted feelings, even if the original cause is forgotten. Healing involves reconnecting all the separate parts so one can feel whole again and reduce the need for addiction. It requires feeling the painful emotions with time, repetition, and safety. Nathan had a strong emotional reaction during a workplace prank that mirrored his past bullying, showing he was processing old feelings. Events in the present can trigger processing of past trauma. Nathan's desire to drink hasn't fully gone away, but he's able to sit with difficult feelings rather than numb them with alcohol. He understands urges to drink signify distress, 
that needs address. We often have a harsh, critical inner voice because we internalized criticisms from important people in our early lives, like parents, teachers, siblings. We learn to be self-critical as a way to feel accepted and loved. Self-criticism is a defense mechanism. It aims to suppress parts of ourselves that we were taught are unacceptable. However, battling the critical voice doesn't help. We need to cultivate a kinder, more compassionate voice. It can be easier to express vulnerability in terms of our bodies, feeling fat, ugly, unlovable, rather than difficult emotions, sad, angry, jealous. Body image issues are often a way of expressing underlying fragility fears of rejection, and feelings of not being enough. With Fiona, her harsh inner critic comes from being criticized and humiliated by her ex-husband and boss. She's more comfortable with harsh treatment than kindness because she doesn't feel she deserves love or acceptance. Slowly cultivating self-compassion rather than self-criticism can help quiet the critical inner voice over time. We must address the underlying fears, beliefs, and emotions it aims to suppress. So in summary, our inner critic aims to protect us based on past experiences, but ultimately does more harm than good. Developing self-compassion is key to overcoming its negative impact. Our fears about physical appearance are often actually fears about rejection and not being accepted by others. We worry about being pretty slash skinny because we think that's what it takes to avoid rejection. These fears stem from experiences of rejection, often in childhood. We criticize ourselves to try and prevent that initial hurt from happening. Fiona struggled with body image issues. She opens up about her childhood, where her mother was ill and often in the hospital. Fiona was cared for by her strict, judgmental grandmother. Fiona internalized all her difficult feelings, anger at her mother, loneliness, because she didn't want to burden her fragile mother. She blamed herself, thinking she was the problem. As children, we often think we are more powerful than we are and may believe we caused a parent's illness. Fiona carried this guilt and self-blame into adulthood. The moral defense makes children blame themselves rather than see parents as bad to maintain the bond needed for survival. But this turns inward anger and blame onto themselves. As adults, we remain overly critical of ourselves due to this unconscious belief that we are bad. Reclaiming anger towards those who actually hurt us can help alleviate self-blame. In summary, early experiences of rejection can manifest as body image issues and harsh self-criticism as a way to prevent further hurt. But the root cause lies in childhood wounds, and healing involves acknowledging hurtful experiences without self-blame. Fiona is attending therapy sessions where she is learning to be kinder to herself. In the past, Fiona would harshly criticize herself for any mistakes or perceived flaws. Her therapist helps her connect to her little Fiona, her inner child self. They realize little Fiona didn't deserve the criticism. She was just an innocent child. This helps Fiona start to feel defensive and protective of little Fiona. She gets angry at those who criticized her as a child. Through this process called reparenting, Fiona is learning to apply compassion to herself just as she now feels for little Fiona. One day, Fiona proudly tells her therapist that when faced with criticism from her boss, she was able to resist harsh self-criticism and instead comfort herself with kindness. By connecting to her inner child self and feeling compassion, Fiona is breaking out of her pattern of harsh self-criticism and instead treating herself with care and dating and relationships make us vulnerable by evoking primal needs for love and fears of rejection hurt. It's normal to feel triggered. Society encourages us to be independently happy while also pressuring us to be in relationships. This can lead to feelings of shame, whether single or coupled. We are social creatures who thrive on connection. There is nothing wrong with wanting a relationship to fulfill this need. Healing can occur within relationships, not just by avoiding love. Growth happens through confronting triggers in a new way. Unrealistic expectations are placed on partners to fulfill all relational needs. This sets people up for discipline. When single, build other supportive relationships and pursue meaningful activities to alleviate loneliness and pressure on potential partners. Some prefer singleness, and that is valid. For others, avoidance of intimacy keeps old wounds unhealed, sabotaging future relationships. Fantasy relationships provide a safer way to fulfill relational needs than real intimacy, which is risky and triggering. 
This maintains the status quo, but prevents growth. The key message is that both singleness and relationships can promote healing and growth, when approached in a balanced, self-aware way without shame or unrealistic expectations. Connection is important, but can be found in many forms. Jay has always been a romantic who falls hard for girls easily. He idealizes relationships and is looking for his soulmate. He finally thinks he found the one in Yaz after seeing her perform at a jazz bar. Their relationship moves very quickly but then small irritations start to emerge. Jay begins doubting the relationship and worrying they aren't compatible. His friends try to convince him she's perfect, but he can't shake the doubts. In a moment of weakness, he kisses another girl while drunk. This leads to the breakup with Yaz, which devastates him as he realizes too late that she was what he wanted. Jay goes to therapy seeking understanding of why he sabotages relationships. His therapist believes it stems from childhood trauma, the death of his best friend led Jay to view intimacy as risky and assume people will inevitably hurt him. Jay initially attaches very strongly to the therapist as well, idealizing their sessions. But when the therapist makes a small mistake, it confirms Jay's fears and he withdraws, unable to tolerate imperfections or vulnerabilities in close relationships. Here are some key points about loneliness and connecting to your true self. Loneliness stems from a lack of feeling truly seen and understood. It's about the quality of connection, not just the quantity of people around you. We all develop a false self or social mask as a way to protect our vulnerabilities and please others. This gets in the way of deep connection. Our ability to be our true self depends on how accepted and loved we felt by our parents as children. If needs weren't met, we rely more on the false self. Signs of a strong false self include feeling empty even with people, lack of emotions, vulnerability, people-pleasing, living for others' approval. Loneliness can reflect an inner child feeling alone and unseen. We need to connect to that vulnerable part of ourselves. To connect to our true self, we must lower defenses, take off social masks, show authentic needs feelings, and be vulnerable with others in a gradual way. This leads to feeling more whole and less alone. The key is rediscovering our authenticity by acknowledging how we've been hiding parts of ourselves and making small steps to open up and show our true nature to trusting others. This builds self-acceptance and healing connections. Romantic relationships tend to be more challenging than other types of relationships because the stakes are higher. Rejection from a romantic partner can feel more threatening due to the expectations and level of intimacy involved. Dating adds extra pressure since there is uncertainty around whether the relationship will continue or break up. This activates our innate fear of abandonment from early relationships with caregivers. Friends and colleagues do not carry the same risks of breaking up, so we are less sensitive to issues like delayed text responses from them but romantic partners eliciting more anxiety and overthinking over small things, setting romantic expectations like living together, sharing finances, having a family together increases the complexity compared to friendships. Relationship milestones mirror family bonds from child. Intense chemistry feels good initially, but can obscure issues and cloud judgment. It may indicate unresolved attachment issues if it leads to obsessive behaviors instead of a healthy bonding. Therapy can help address underlying fears that interfere with forming stable relationships. In summary, romantic relationships activate deeper fears and demands due to their paramount importance to our survival instincts from childhood. This can make dating anxiety-provoking and form stable partnerships challenging without addressing emotional wounds from the past. Mira meets a man named Jay at a bar. She finds him very attractive and cool, but feels he is out of her league. They go on a date and seem to hit it off, with flirty touches and Mira making Jay laugh. Mira is hopeful, but still unsure how interested Jay really is. Their relationship continues in a hot and cold pattern. Jay will cancel or delay dates, leaving Mira anxious and obsessed with getting his attention. But when they are together, the chemistry is intense. Mira falls deeply in love with Jay despite the inconsistency. She waits desperately for messages and contact from him, it is revealed that the narrator knows Jay from being his therapist previously. They are concerned about Mira getting hurt due to knowing Jay's past issues with intimacy and relationships. Mira's background of parental rejection as a child with an absent father 
is analyzed as making her more vulnerable to becoming obsessed with someone inconsistent like Jay, triggering fears of abandonment. The summary suggests Mira and Jay's relationship is based more on intense chemistry, activating fear of rejection, rather than a healthy foundation for love. The key points are Mira becoming obsessively in love and anxious waiting for Jay despite his hot and cold behavior, and her background of childhood rejection making her susceptible to recreating that dynamic and becoming addicted to the intense highs and lows. Her intense feelings seem to stem from triggering early wounds rather than being a truly caring partnership. Obsession over a past romantic partner who rejected or broke up with you is a way to avoid feeling the real pain of loss and grief. Staying mentally engaged with them helps keep them alive in your mind rather than fully letting go. Rejection activates the brain's reward and motivation centers, making the desire to chase and regain that person somewhat addictive. Over time, this obsession will lessen as those brain areas are less activated. Unresolved issues from childhood relationships like an inconsistent or rejecting parent can contribute to obsessively chasing a new romantic partner who mirrors that pattern. It feels familiar, even if unhealthy. Repeating negative relationship patterns from the past is acting from our wounded child self, seeking to gain the love and approval we lacked before. True healing involves working through past wounds to choose partners from a place of self worth slowing distancing oneself from triggers of obsession, feeling the real pain of loss, and focusing on personal growth beyond the relationship are important steps in moving forward in a healthier way. We tend to be attracted to and repeat relationship patterns that are familiar from our childhood, even if they cause pain. This is because familiar situations feel normal and because we unconsciously seek different outcomes to heal past hurts. When trying to get over rejection, we may obsess over the other person to feel a sense of control over an uncontrollable situation. Repeating thought patterns helps avoid difficult emotions. Acceptance and fully grieving the loss is important for healing from obsession. One must accept what happened cannot be changed in order to write a new story. Having an emotionally unavailable partner protects one from vulnerability, but does not support healthy intimacy. If constantly choosing unavailable partners, it likely stems from one's own fears of intimacy from past relationship wounds. Focusing on personal growth, like increasing self-worth, can help change relationship patterns by shifting what type of treatment one feels they deserve. Therapeutic techniques like grieving can help work through childhood traumas fueling unhealthy behaviors. Choosing stable, kind partners may feel unfamiliar and boring if not used to healthy relationships. Drama and chaos can feel more comfortable if it mimics one's upbringing, but one deserves caring treatment. Here is a summary of the key points about paying attention in situations hips often occur when both parties avoid true intimacy and commitment due to underlying fears. Staying in an undefined relationship is a way to protect oneself emotionally. It's important to reflect on why one chooses emotionally unavailable partners. This may relate to fear of vulnerability learned from caregivers as a child. Unavailable partners allow avoidance of intimacy. Healing involves understanding one's own attachment patterns and fears around commitment closeness through self-reflection and therapy. It means feeling the vulnerability and risk that comes with intimacy. Acting differently in relationships is key, such as communicating one's fears to partners and allowing oneself to depend on them emotionally. Change happens gradually through difficult conversations and boundary setting. The type of partner chosen reveals inner wounds that need healing. We are drawn to those mirroring our childhood experiences for better or worse. Healing involves selecting partners who can help meet emotional needs. So in summary, the emphasis is on turning our attention inward to understand relational patterns and fears and how past experiences shape present choices as a first step towards more intimate, fulfilling relationships. Here are some suggestions for how Connor and Abby can work on their respective attachment styles to have a healthier relationship. Connor should reflect on his avoidance and learn to communicate his needs more clearly instead of withdrawing. Seeing a therapist could help him understand his fears of intimacy. Abby should work on not taking Connor's distance personally and learn to self-soothe. Therapy could aid in fixing her anxiety triggers from childhood. They could read up on attachment theory together 
to gain insight into each other's patterns. Having empathy and understanding is key. Connor should compromise by spending scheduled quality time with Abby to reassure her without losing his independence. Abby needs to give Connor space when requested instead of escalating her anxiety. Trust and flexibility are important. Open communication about feelings without accusations is important. Active listening when the other shares their experience. Physical affection like hugging can help Abby feel secure in between time apart for Connor to recharge. Counseling together could help them learn to meet each other's needs in a balanced, healthy way through supported compromise and understanding of one another. With work, their relationship has potential for growth. Here is a summary of the key points about attachment theory and how it relates to Connor and Abby's relationship. Attachment theory explains how our early relationships with caregivers shape our expectations and behaviors in adult relationships. Babies are wired to seek closeness for survival. Secure attachment develops when caregivers are consistently responsive and attentive. Insecure attachment can develop if caregivers are inconsistent, rejecting, anxious, etc. Insecure styles are anxious attachment, clingy, needy, and avoidant attachment, distant, independent. Disorganized attachment involves both. As adults, our attachment style affects how we view intimacy, deal with conflict, regulate emotions, and so on in our romantic relationships. Connor has an avoidant style, so he seeks distance and independence. Abby has an anxious style, so she seeks closeness and reassurance. Their conflicting needs, her need for closeness versus his need for space, reflect a common dynamic seen in anxious avoidant couples. Their attachment styles are underlying their relationship patterns and conflict. Understanding attachment theory can provide insight into one's own behaviors and role in relationships to help address recurring issues. In summary, Attachment theory explains how Connor and Abby developed different needs for intimacy versus distance due to their early caregiver relationships and how this now plays out as a source of tension between them. Connor and Abby have an anxious avoidant attachment dynamic where she wants more closeness and he pulls away, triggering each other's insecurities. Without awareness of their own attachment styles and good communication, these relationships often fail, as each blames the key is understanding projection. We tend to see in others what we deny in ourselves. Anxious people may project avoidance. Avoidance may project neediness. In therapy, Connor initially blames Abby, but the therapist starts to feel his own avoidance. Exploring Connor's childhood reveals he learned to bury sensitivity due to family shaming. Now seeing emotions as we progress requires Connor to become aware of his own avoidance. Instead of blaming Abby, and to feel comfortable with vulnerability, as his withdrawal reinforces her anxiety. Understanding each person's role is important to transforming the relationship. The main points are that anxious avoidant couples get stuck in a negative cycle by projecting weaknesses onto each other rather than seeing their own role, and that therapeutic insight into one's own attachment patterns and childhood origins is needed to overcome this and achieve security within the relationship. Here are the key points about codependency, boundaries, and people-pleasing in relationships. Kelly loses herself in relationships by failing to maintain strong boundaries and a sense of self. She becomes incredibly focused on her partner and bases her self-worth on making them. With Trish, Kelly idealizes her in the beginning and is unable to see any flaws or imperfections. The relationship moves extremely quickly into cohabitation. Cracks start to emerge as Trish exhibits concerning controlling and abusive behaviors like getting drunk and insulting Kelly's friends. But Kelly excuses it and promises not to get A pattern develops where Trish acts out, drinking, anger, etc., and Kelly takes care of her and promises things will change. She sacrifices her own needs and well-being to manage Trish's emotions and behavior. This is a classic codependent relationship where one person, Kelly, loses their sense of self and independence by constantly trying to fix, care for, and placate their emotionally or verbally abusive partner, Trish. Kelly struggles with clear boundaries, independence, and making decisions that value her own happiness rather than just trying to please others like Trish. This prevents healthy relations. The root causes likely stem from Kelly's childhood and difficulties with separation individuation, where she struggled to establish her own identity apart from her caregiver. Kelly's relationship with Trish becomes increasingly codependent and enmeshed over time. 
Kelly stops doing things she enjoys like seeing friends and art exhibitions to spend more time taking care of Trish. Kelly becomes preoccupied with trying to fix Trish by getting her into therapy and to stop drinking. However, this backfires as Trish gets worse. The more Kelly helps, Kelly neglects her own needs and desires in the relationship. She focuses only on pleasing Trish during sex and doesn't orgasm herself. Kelly has lost her sense of independence and boundaries. She sees herself and Trish as one. This is an indicator of an enmeshed and codependent relationship. Codependent relationships are inherently imbalanced, with one person, Kelly, doing most of the giving and caretaking, while the other, Trish, does most of the taking. This dynamic was likely modeled in Kelly's relationships growing up. Moving past codependency involves developing a stronger sense of self, establishing healthy boundaries, and emotionally separating from partners and parents to have independent identities rather than blurred or merged roles. People-pleasing and being overly focused on others' needs leads one to become disconnected from their own feelings, needs, and boundaries. This is called self-abandonment. Resentment often develops when people abandon their own needs to please others or avoid their disapproval. However, people find it difficult to express boundaries and say no due to fears of abandonment or conflict. Childhood experiences, like being made to feel emotionally responsible for parents, or facing extreme disapproval for asserting independence, shape patterns of self-abandonment and codependency in relationships. Healing involves processing childhood wounds, strengthening intuitin around one's own needs, creating healthy separation and boundaries in relationships, and improving communication of feelings and boundaries. The goal is developing interdependence rather than codependency or people-pleasing at one's own expense. Setting boundaries is important for preventing codependency and creating separation between yourself and others. It shows self-respect by communicating what is and isn't acceptable. Self-respect acts as a barrier to codependency because you are meeting your own needs rather than relying on others. However, expressing boundaries may not always get a positive reaction. The key steps to setting boundaries are to identify what the boundary is, communicate it clearly without blaming, and enforce consequences if it is not respected. It's important to start with small boundaries and gradually increase them. True boundaries require action through consequences if not respected. When setting boundaries, it's also important to consider the other person's needs and communicate compassionately. The goal is a balance between meeting your own and others' needs. People may react negatively if they benefited from a lack of boundaries previously. Withstanding this discomfort is part of setting boundaries. Ultimately, the aim is to move from codependent to interdependent relationships where both partners feel like separate individuals who choose to be together rather than relying fully on each other. Dexter and Georgia have been having the same fight about cleany years, but it's actually about deeper issues in their relationship and personal history. When they first met, Georgia's messiness was charming, but it now stresses Dexter out, making him feel disrespected and taken for granted. Dexter cleans the kitchen meticulously, but feels ignored when Georgia comes home and doesn't acknowledge his work. This triggers feelings from his past with his critical mother. Georgia is exhausted from work, but can't relax without Dexter criticizing her. She feels stressed and controlled. Their fights escalate from misunderstood triggers into personal attacks. Neither communicates their real feelings of rejection or vulnerability. People often repeat patterns from their parents unintentionally. Dexter learned to express hurt through criticism like his mother did. To move past repetitive arguments, people need to honestly share their feelings rather than fighting about superficial topics and learn healthier communication styles than those modeled by their parents. The key points are that repetitive arguments usually stem from deeper emotional wounds neither party directly addresses, and changing entrenched patterns requires self-reflection on one's own patterns and learning alternative communication strategies. It's important to communicate difficult feelings like anger or hurt in a vulnerable, non-confrontational way by using I feel statements rather than blaming the other person. This avoids putting them on the defensive. Notice what triggers your feelings and reflect on whether you may be projecting your own insecurities. 
Take accountability for your own emotions rather than just blaming others. Acknowledge the other person's feelings, even if you disagree, to show you care about their perspective. Tolerate discomfort to have open communication rather than avoiding conflict to please others or avoid upsetting them. Communicate when regulated rather than during fights or when dysregulated, as things can escalate without listening. Take breaks if needed. Be curious. Listen actively to understand the other view rather than just preparing your response. Respect each other's perspectives. It can be easier to communicate differently with new people who don't know your past patterns rather than changing long-held dynamics with familiar people. Maeve is struggling with adjusting to work and family life after having children. She feels lost and meaningless. She began an affair with a coworker, Joe, which gave her a sense of excitement, mystery, and feeling alive again. However, she also feels immense guilt. The therapist understands cheating is complex with many potential underlying reasons, like feeling too close distant in a relationship, needing connection, fear of intimacy, resentment, revenge, etc. It is often an act of escaping issues in the primary relationship. Most people don't cheat just because they are evil, but because they are hurting or craving something different. It allows escaping into a fantasy without conflict. The therapist's goal is not to shame Maeve, but provide a safe place to openly discuss her fears and feelings without fear of judgment. Understanding the reasons behind cheating can help address the real issues, whereas shame often prevents open communication. The focus is on understanding Maeve's experience, not condemnation, and helping her work through the root causes rather than just tasks or homework. In summary, the therapist seeks to understand rather than judge Maeve's cheating in the context of her overall relationship and psychological state, with the aim of addressing the underlying issues through open discussion rather than acting out of shame or fear. Maeve comes to therapy ready to tell her partner Finn about her, her, her affair. After six months of talking through issues in their relationship, she wants honesty to potentially rebuild something. Some of the issues that led to the affair included Maeve feeling like Finn's parent rather than an equal partner due to lack of communication and feeling unsupported. Over several months of therapy, Maeve has gained the ability to express frustration, anger, love, guilt, and other feelings towards Finn. Keeping these things silent in the past was partly why she had the Telling Finn the truth feels scary, but also like dropping an honest bomb that could help them salvage and rebuild their relationship. Maeve has hope they can communicate better and see each other as romantic partners instead of parent-child roles. Maeve is proud of herself for being ready to be honest, even though it will be difficult. She takes her coat to leave therapy and tell Finn the truth, seeking a new beginning, if possible, through open communication. If a child's parents are depressed, anxious, dismissive, needy, or angry, it can damage their ability to trust others. They may believe people let me down. To protect themselves, people build defenses, like not trusting anyone or avoiding relationships to avoid further hurt. They look for signs of betrayal. This blueprint affects future relationships. People may unconsciously choose partners who repeat childhood wounds like betrayal. They ignore red flags and focus only on the positive. When trust is broken in relationships, it becomes harder to trust others. Expectations become negative, like believing all relationships will involve cheating. This stems from the original wound of not being able to trust the people meant to keep you safe as a child. To rebuild trust after cheating, one must reflect on the relationship and communicate fears instead of acting out in mistrustful ways like controlling behaviors. Turn her inwards rather than focusing anger outwards. Decide if staying or leaving is best based on the partner's response. The goal is learning to handle future hurt, not avoiding it completely. It seems Maeve endured wounds from childhood rejection that have never fully healed. Breakups can re-trigger those deep feelings of not being good enough. With compassion and support, she may be able to process the grief and loss from this relationship in a way that helps her continued growth. Focusing inward on self-acceptance rather than outward seeking approval could aid in her moving forward in a healthy manner. Maeve was struggling to accept Finn breaking up with her. She felt rejected and unworthy, reminding her of when her father left her family and favored her sister. When Finn stopped helping around the house, she sought an affair to feel loved and important again. 
His rejection triggered deep-seated feelings of inadequacy from her childhood. By winning Finn back, she hoped to regain control over his rejection and prove to herself that she is worthy of love. However, this was really about addressing the underlying wounds from her father. The therapist helps Maeve connect her current relationship struggles to feelings of rejection and abandonment from her father as a child. Reliving this pain through therapy allows for deep... As Maeve grows to understand her father's flaws were not really about her, she starts to believe less that there was something wrong with her. This lessens her obsession over winning Finn back to prove her worth. Key steps to moving on from a breakup involve grieving, refocusing on yourself, prioritizing self-care, avoiding contact with the ex, leaning on friends, family, and addressing any deeper wounds or triggers from childhood. Fully feeling the pain is important to processing it and preventing it from negatively impacting future relationships. The passage discusses how change and feeling empowered is a process, not something that happens overnight or by blaming others. True change requires recognizing the role we play in our own suffering and choosing to suffer less. While abusive situations are not the victim's fault, using victim terminology can be disempowering as it suggests there is nothing that can be done. However, getting out of abusive situations requires great strength, and recognizing the choices we have can help find solutions. When feeling powerless or stuck, it's important to assess how we may be choosing suffering through our thoughts and actions and consider how we could choose peace instead. Therapy works because it provides a reparative relationship where one can be vulnerable without judgment. Healing also occurs through supportive relationships outside therapy, by opening up and being accepted for who we are. Change is difficult because we resist loss and cling to familiar patterns, even if unhealthy. True change involves believing we have responsibility over our lives and choices. Lastly, change takes time as it requires repeated practice to form new neural pathways over old habits. Instant results are unlikely, and a process-oriented approach is needed for real sustainable change. The passage discusses how changing deeply ingrained neural pathways is difficult and takes repetition. Our brains are wired to avoid vulnerability and take the safer route of avoidance through years of conditioning. Even if we force ourselves to be open once, our default is to return to avoidance. To make a lasting change, we need to repeat the new vulnerable behavior many times until it becomes ingrained as the new automatic pathway. Our brains remain plastic into adulthood, so change is possible, but it takes sustained effort over time. Going off the well-worn path of avoidance feels unfamiliar and unsafe at first. When trying to help a client open up, rushing them or forcing the issue will not make them feel safe enough. Change takes time and gentleness to establish safety. Forcing the egg of vulnerability too soon could cause more harm than good. Healing is a process that is never fully complete. Lessons may be relevant at different life stages. Staying curious and open to understanding ourselves is the key to ongoing progress, not thinking we have all the... The author thanks several people who helped and supported her during the writing process of her fish for helping come up with characters and during the writing process, her book club for being early readers even on their phones, and Pete for getting the book professionally printed and bound, her wonderful friends who provide both depth and silliness, Nicola, her therapist, who has taught her more about therapy than any book, and largely thanks to her and past therapists, the book would not exist, and her life would be worse. Her extended family for support and enthusiasm, her parents for inspiring her love of reading slash writing and believing in her, her sister Katie for being her best friend, teaching her how to be vulnerable, and always being by herself. Her partner, Pete, for surprising her in the best ways and showing her a kind of love she didn't know existed. Her dog, Albie, her co-star and in-house therapist who provides unconditional love. She expresses appreciation and gratitude to all these people who helped and supported her during the writing process.